Is this your first lecture after the holidays? Yeah. 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 Then middle name is Satan. Then yes, sorry. Yeah. So welcome back. Under and fire. So today we're going to see the second lecture about uh, design patterns. And specifically, we're going to discuss iterating uh, design uh, the iterator design pattern. But before we move to the actual complete discussion of this new design pattern, I want to take a step back and try to offer you a slightly broader perspective on design patterns themselves, in general. What are they and what are the common aspects of these design patterns? Then I will move on to the, to, to the, to the iterator, we'll see a couple of, uh, of concrete examples of implementations and we'll draw some. Now, uh, design patterns are all instances, tend to be instances of three major groups that you could consider to be the design patterns of design patterns. And these are uh, behavioral, structural, and creational design patterns. Now, typically, all the existing patterns can be uh, can fall under one of these three. Uh, the first that we have seen, the visitor and the null object. Do you remember the null object, which, which piece of last lecture it was? option itself was the null object because it's a way to have an instance of now. None is behaves like now because it represents absence of data, but it's not now, so you can call methods on it. And specifically the only method that we had on option was no. visit. Yes. Therefore the visitor. Now behavioral pairs typically um, are ways to describe yeah, basic aspects of behavior. How does something behave? How does uh, something identify itself, for example? That's the visitor. How does something identify being now or not now, etc. Uh, another one that we're going to see today is the iterator pattern, which captures the behavior of, <laughs> take a wild guess, iteration through a collection. Yes, very good. Uh, now, structural patterns are design patterns that make it possible to compose or otherwise define relationships between entities. Uh, structural patterns are ways essentially to build data, to say, okay, I want to have this and this somehow coupled or grouped together. So we build structures. They are ways to abstract the building of structures. Uh, among these patterns, we're only going to see two. We're going to see the adapter. Uh, and the decorator. Now the decorator is nice because it says, okay, suppose you have a structure and you want to add some behavior or some additional data to it, then you do it by means of a decoration. For example, you have a, a button, okay, in a form, you know, button, and you want to make a blinking button. You can imagine a blinking button is just a decoration which adds some structure to an existing button, right? Good. The adapter, on the other hand, is uh, something that you can imagine very easily and very visually is the object-oriented version of this. So it's a way of taking one structure and, map and mapping it, making it behave like another structure that is kind of convertible to. Uh, the adapter and the decorator, the adapter we're certainly going to see, and the hours of the decorator later on. Adapter is uh, next week. The last patterns are creational design patterns. So we have behavior, so how do things behave? Structure, how are things built? And now we have creation, because uh, the assumption of behavioral and structural design patterns is that we have something already, and we want to have it behave somehow, or be shaped somehow. But what we want to abstract is the creation of objects. Because creation might, well, be, complex, be dependent on complex factors. Uh, creation might depend on the choice of the user. The user might want to create a table rather than another table. So you know for sure that you get a table, but what data do you have in the table? Uh, what uh, records, what columns make up the table? And so on. Do you understand what, what I'm saying? So you know that you end up with a table, but which specific table you have no idea. How do we build this? Well, with the so-called factory. So basically we have an object that we, we delegate the decision of building patterns, uh, of building objects to. Uh, but even more abstractly, these groups of design patterns 
or they tend to fall under the same guiding principles. And these principles make it possible to derive and understand not only the old design patterns, but also to create new ones. Because design patterns are not fixed in stone. You know, that if you don't use an existing design pattern, something is going to come down from the sky and smite you. You can build your own. You can adapt them. You can make them grow. And how do you do this? By following the underlying principles. And uh, these principles are actually refinements of the broader ideas of encapsulation and scaffolding. Now, these principles that you will come across, these terms are very common. Have you ever heard of them? Dry, kiss, and solid. They're, I would dare say, uh, kind of cultural cornerstones of software engineering. Now, dry is the principle of don't repeat yourself. Kiss is the design principle of keep it simple and stupid. Or the slightly less polite version, keep it simple, comma, stupid. Uh, and SOLID is an acronym that we'll expand later for single responsibility, open close list of substitution, interface aggregation, and dependency immersion. Mm -hmm. Rolls right off your tongue. Right, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to expand it uh, within a couple of slides. So DRY, uh, according to, to the principles of DRY, every piece of knowledge that we have about our system, so we have the system and it exists. The, 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 a piece of reality, which might be customers or their shopping carts, whatever. Okay, so this is reality here, and we have some knowledge, a vision about it. We know a bunch of facts about this reality, and what we typically want to do as programmers, as software engineers, we take our knowledge about the system and we translate that into code. Yes, thank you. After almost a year, it's nice that at least one person gets it. Thanks. So. The point is, every single fact, every single piece of knowledge that we have, for example, a cart contains a bunch of, a shopping cart contains a bunch of Grocery. groceries, yes, or products, or orders, whatever, but something like this, has to be unambiguously represented once and only once within the system. For example, if you provide one implementation for a shopping cart uh, that's empty, another one for a shopping cart that has one element, another one for a shopping cart with two elements, and so on. Is this a good thing? No, then you're, then you're spreading a bit of parameterized knowledge that a shopping cart contains n items in it, and you're spreading this along multiple classes. If you don't even have a, a shopping cart class, and you just put the products next to the user or whatever, then you're mixing <coughs> things you are making a mess because knowledge about the shopping cart is not really stored anywhere. Hopefully under something that's called shopping cart. Okay? So, uh, violations of dry are typically referred to as wet. So write everything twice, we enjoy typing, waste everyone's time, and so on. And I think that the twice is, ah, you could even do three times, four times, five times. Um, uh, we've just created some, some assignments of uh, data science from uh, current uh, third year students. And there is an algorithm that is k means that uh, where the k varies. And the students have to build uh, uh, the algorithm for k equals 5, 10, and 20. And what we got regularly from a bunch of students was the same algorithm for k equals to 5, k equals to 10, k equals to 20 in three separate classes. And the classes are exactly a copy of each other, but where the number 5 has been replaced into the number 10, and then the number 10 has been replaced into the number 20. And in some brilliant cases, you still see a 5 that's missed the replace. So it's tw 20 everywhere besides a couple of points where it's 5. Yes, good. That's our aim. Who wants, to, who wants to build software like this? It will slap any hand that goes up. Yes, good. So <laughs> now, um, so KISS is uh, a bit, a bit an, a, another take. It's always the same concept, actually, encapsulation and loose coupling, which is simplicity and splitting things and componing them, uh, so componing them back together simply. Uh, the idea of KISS is that uh, uh, most systems work best if we keep them simple rather than complicated. Mind you, complicated, not complex. Do you know, does anyone know the difference between complicated and complex? Yes? Complicated is unnecessary complex? Yes. And complex is just complex. I mean, if you're building a simulation for a, for a fluid dynamic uh, system that controls the flow of air over the rocket, it's complex. Yeah. That's it. It's always going to be complex. On the other hand, if you make it 
65 methods with lots of parameters to open a, a, a TCP socket. And it's complicated. You're overcomplicating. And this overcomplication is the thing that we want to avoid. So what we try to achieve is simplicity as a key goal in design. Uh, and if you think about, well, I don't know how many of you know the lab calculus. A couple of you might have encountered it. Yes. You were there. So the lambda calculus is tiny, but from it you can build gigantic things, actually. And similarly for everyone else, the stack and heap are not so big uh, as systems. I mean, the stack and heap is just a table of names and values, and the heap is a table of IDs and values. It's not a complex concept by itself. And with it, the way you can use it is complex. You can, you, you can build a computer. We don't need the concept of stack and heap in the program counter and a few rules, right? So, it, I mean, it's, it's powerful, but the concept itself, I mean, it's, it's a table with another table. Ooh. Got it. So we try to build software in the same way. Simple, small things that we then combine together into complex compositions. Uh, solid, on the other hand, well, it's a, a bit of a longer uh, expansion. So solid, the S, a class should have only a single responsibility. So a class does exactly one thing. Uh, Entity should be open for extension, but closed for modification. So the entity, you can inherit from it, you can add methods to it, you can add functionality, but you cannot change the way it already works. If you change it, if you swap a method for another method, you are certainly going to break something. But if you add a new method that uses the existing ones to offer a new piece of functionality, that should always be possible. Uh, L is the least of a substitution principle, which is actually the strongest. If you build software based on an interface, okay, you have a piece of code that is based on an interface. What do you expect from every concrete implementation of the interface? Yeah, so the methods of the interface. Otherwise, it doesn't compile. But in terms of behavior. piece of code that relies on an interface, okay? What do you expect of every concrete implementation of this interface? Should there be a specific concrete implementation that works and another one that doesn't? Yes, so every concrete implementation works as expected and defined by the interface. So a concrete implementation should not provide a method that always throws an exception because it's not implemented. Okay? If you have an interface that, I don't know, yeah, the flower interface, okay? Then the flower interface, if you, call, if you try to smell the flower, it should not eat you up. It would be very embarrassing. It would be unexpected. Okay, so everything should always behave. It doesn't matter which flower you put in there. Every time you smell the flower, you just smell it. That's it. You don't, I don't know, get eaten by it or uh, So that, that's the point. You should, you should, no, no. That, but that's the point. It should, uh, violating this principle should be weird. You should really, you really have to do something weird to violate this principle. It's a kind of a principle of, of no unexpected surprises. Are surprises good in code? No. Never. Someone comes to you and says during a project, oh, there, that, that was surprising behavior. And you cry. And by default, you should, you should have tears welling up your eyes. Now, uh, we want lots of specific small interfaces that all have a single responsibility, rather than big interfaces that tend to do too many things at the, at the same time. And then high-level modules should not be dependent from low-level concrete implementations. So everything you build should be dependent only on interfaces as much as possible and not on concrete implementations. If you achieve this, then you can swap the concrete implementations because you're only relying on interfaces. Building new versions of the modules without having to well, go crazy. So in the course, from now on, we'll try, when introducing a design pattern, to present it along with its uh, fundamental principles. And now, let's move on to iterating collections. Uh, now, our fundamental goal today is to study how to access the elements of a collection without having to expose the actual structure of the collection. We will do this by means of a design pattern, which is the iterator, which is a behavioral design pattern, because iterating something 
is an action, it's a behavior, and as such falls under the behavioral design patterns. Uh, iterating something doesn't add structure to the thing that we are iterating. It doesn't. But what it, what it actually does is it changes its behavior the way it's using uh, What stems, uh, where does this problem stem from? Well, how many collections can you think of? <coughs> collections of data. Think of dev for example. What's the first collection that comes to your mind from your experiences with dev and the second project? Link the lists. That's a collection, right? Is that the only one? Array. Hash table? Yes. Uh, also, we have the standard implementation of linked lists. Normal list. The normal lists, exactly. How many possible collection implementations? Yes? Infinite. Yes. Also, because we could just decide to re implement existing collections like the linked list. Who knows? So, plenty of options. Actually, uh, even the option that we've seen in the last lecture is a collection. What sort of collection would it be? I mean, why is it a collection? Because there are two choices. And so, the collection with yes or no. yeah. has either no elements, so it's like a list which has either no elements, like an empty list, or just, just one. But it's a collection, right? You could iterate it. It would stop right away or after one step, but you can still iterate it. Okay? Good. So, any in all collections, from options to arrays to a network of, of, of positions on a map, well, they can all be iterated roughly in the same way. So what do you expect from the iteration of any collection, independently of the collection itself? Oh, come on. What do you think is going to happen if we iterate a collection? What do we get out of the iteration? You can always map a function of other... How much easier than that? What does iteration result in? Look, I'll mime it for you. What do you think? Oh, I'll let's turn the spotlight off. Come on. Which multiple values? Which values? I mean, we have a collection. Which values do you think are going to come out of iterating the collection? The ones in the collection. The ones in the collection. Yes, it stands <laughs> to reason. Uh, all of them, or let's say all of them, but not the third one, or the 13th. We don't do that some, because it's unlucky. It depends on how you iterate it. Yeah, but do we skip a random element? No. That would be not be a good idea, right? <laughs> so we want all the elements, right? Do we want the third element twice? Sorry? Do we want the third element twice? No. No, I would want that. So every element is iterating exactly once. That's true. Exactly. What? You get the same collection iterated by whatever you Yes. So whatever was the content of the collection, if you iterate it, then you get all its, all its elements. Not repeated and not skipping any. Okay? Good. So the general idea is in going, that was the miming thing, through all the elements, one by one, so you don't skip a bunch, until there are no more to skip. Now, unfortunately, every collection has its own different implementation, and this is an issue. Why? So you cannot make an abstract uh, uh, thing to uh, iterate all of them? Yes. And the reason why this is a problem is that, suppose your item, every single time you want to go through all the elements of a list, you have to rewrite the same specific code for iterating the list. Every time you want to add the code that iterates an option or an array or whatever, then you have to write the same code. This is repeated. It's a lot of work. And 
if, you're, if you just want to print all the elements of the list and yet you still have to know how the list is built. For example, think back of Dev2. I really want you to, you to recall that experience. <laughs> now, what would it take if you took your code now from, from the practical mode of Dev2, what would it take to change all the custom lists that you built into the standard Python list? What impact would that have on your code? Would you want to do that? <laughs> so, but on the other hand, so, no, I'm going to stay here for a second. The point is, but you just want to go through all the, uh, you know, you remember the cars, the boats, etc. Yes? Roughly? It was too long ago. And the thing is, but you just want to go through all of them and, for example, draw them. So it shouldn't really matter if you said, okay, I now want to use an array, I now want to use a hash table, and now want to use a, a, a standard Python list. It should not make a difference. And yet it would, because you would have to rewrite half of your application. Now, uh, so let, let's take, for example, uh, a link to the list and an array. Uh, the link to the list, you know, is a dynamic data structure made of linked nodes, and the array is a static compact data structure with a fixed number of elements. Uh, should we want to iterate the list, and this is Python code, this is the code that you have written in Python, you remember? So define uh, the, the thing that's going to iterate through the list, and this is, type, this is a node, the current node. And then, why current node dot a is not null, then in current node dot value you have the current value, and then what you do is you do current node is equal to current node dot a. Yes? Does that give you a surge of adrenaline? Yeah. Oh yeah, given your state actually it would be more Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, and the, the, the list of numbers here, since we, we, move it, we move it forward, represents how far we are in the iteration. That's literally like something, it's a reference that's referring to where we are in the whole list. Oh, which in some way doesn't change at all. So this is the history, this is integer. May I go forward or do you need an explanation? No? no. Okay, good. So, uh, similarly, when iterating an array, and look, this kind of looks the same, uh, but the current element for an array it's not a node, because the array is not a link to the list, there are no nodes. So what is it? How do we store information about how far we are in the iteration of the list? The variable? Yeah, duh. One or more variables, yes. But with what content? How do we access an element of an array? By an index. index. And what's the type of the index? Inside. It's an integer. So how do we know how far we've come in the iteration of the array? By storing the index of the last element that we have seen so far. Exactly. That's, that's all we do. So uh, it's, it's on line three. It's separate to emphasize the fact that it's it's somehow separate. It's to make this piece of code look a bit like the previous one. Uh, so, what about the other collections? Do you think that yeah, we're gonna get something similar and yet at the same time different for every other collection? We're going to store either a node, an index, or I don't know, a tile, or a node in a tree, an element in the graph, whatever, for every single of these possible things. And then we're just going to move forward. Oh, by the way, this is in Java exactly the same. Now, uh, so, we do not want to, on one hand, repeat the code for the iteration of every linked list every single time we want to go through a, a linked list. We have multiple linked lists that we might have to go through in multiple places. 
So we don't want to rewrite the iteration logic every single time. We need to go through all the elements, for example, to, to find the smallest or bring them all, etc. And at the same time, we don't want that a piece of code that just has to print all the elements on the screen has to rely, has to, to, to know exactly how the collection is built. So we try to achieve a mechanism that is going to abstract the concrete implementation of the collection from the iteration algorithm of the collection itself. And iteration as a behavior is common to all collections, but the implementation will obviously change. So when we have a behavior that is common to a bunch of concrete things, but with a concrete difference, how do we encode it? Interface. With an interface. So an interface is a way to say, okay, all these things, they are iterable. So iterating means a bunch of things, but we don't know exactly how it's iterable. We only it's iterable. So we only know that it is iterable, but not how if every collection is iterable. That will be specified by the interface itself. And when developers will need to iterate the collection, they will simply use the interface to iterate all collections exactly in the same way. Do you understand this bit? So if we only iterate every collection via the interface for iteration, then if we change the underlying collection, no one's going to notice. Because we are only going through the iterable interface. Okay? Uh, the iterator design pattern refers to all of this activity. And specifically, well, oh, what are the fundamental things that an iterable needs to support? Yes? Next element. Okay, so going to the next element, right? That would be oh, jumping to the next element. Then? Checking if it's the end. Checking if we reach the end. Because when we reach the end, we have to stop. And then? Get the current element. Getting the current element. Okay? So, the fundamental operations that we have are get the current item, move to the next item, and check if you even have a next item. Yes? Does everyone agree with this? Is this clear so far? Okay. Oh, now, what if I told you that by using some of the wisdom that was imparted to you in the last lecture, we might do all of these three things with an interface with a single method? Let the camera take a break. Does anyone yep. have any idea? How can we implement these three things with an interface with a single method that returns a single data structure that tells us everything we want to know about the status of the iteration? No one? Yes? Please enlighten us. Is it? Kind of. <laughs> Okay. So, okay, uh, we said before, a collection is, what's, what's a collection at, at its core? There's a bunch of elements, right? After each other. Yes? Okay. Now, um, so, what if we said, okay, but then again, at some point they stop. So, we could, we could also say that, okay, it's a bunch of elements after each other followed by a bunch of, of, of silences, of, of, of lack of elements, okay? Right? Kind of? J j j can you picture it? So, what if I told you that we have already seen a way to define a collection made up of a single element at most? And what was it? Option. option was the collection of a single element. But option was also a collection with no elements at the same time. So. Could we make a collection, a collection up from just a bunch of options? What do you think? I think so. How so? <coughs> I give you multiple options. Yes, a bunch of options, one after each other. And every option is in the beginning, 
when we have elements, what kind of options do we get? Some or none? We get some. And when we're done, we get none, and the nones are the no elements. So actually, what we can do is define the iterator exactly like this. The iterator only has a, a single method, get next, which returns an option. Now, if we do have a next element, then we get some of the element. If we don't, then we get we get none. Now, uh, in Java, this doesn't change that much. Uh, so suppose we have a collection that has a 5, 3, and 2. Then, uh, the first time we call the get next, we get 5. So, sorry, sum of 5. Then we get, we get the sum of 3, then sum of 2, and then we get none. Because we say, give me the next element, and we get no element. And it says none. What's the next element? None. This kind of makes sense, you know, in English. Okay? And, well, how many nuns can we get? Sorry? Infinite. Infinite. I mean, when the collection is done, you can keep saying, give me the next one, and the next one is, is, is none. Okay? Good. Now, uh, under this assumption, we can implement iterators for every single collection, as long as the list, the array, the stack, whatever collection we want to have has its get next element, uh, its get next method, which returns an i option. So now we so we'll see a couple of, um, of of these implementations. The first one is really very pretty, I think, because it uh, it shows an infinite collection. We can very obviously have an infinite collection. Uh, for example, uh, suppose you're, you're connected to a server that sends you uh, tweets. Okay? How many tweets are there? Sorry? Well, until Twitter fails, there's probably going to be tweets, right? So it's a potentially infinite collection, right? It's an unbounded collection, you might also say. Uh, similarly, another sort of iterator that we could build is the iterator that iterates through all the natural numbers, through all the interests, uh, yeah, through all the natural numbers. Look, the natural list implements iterator of int. It has current, which is minus one in the beginning. Then when we say get next, current is incremented. So in the beginning it goes to zero, then one, etc. And we return new sum of current. Why do we never return none in this case? Because you increase the current of one every time. And how many natural numbers do we expect to have? I don't even know. <laughs> Infinite. Infinite, yeah. I mean, there is a boundary of, of yeah. how big the, the, the natural number is, but you're probably going to die of old age before you get to, especially a 64 bit integer boundary. Or not what you would be, it would take years. Anyway, so it seems boring. So, um, that's the reason why we always have an element, so we, do, we never say we have no more elements. Um, dealing with lists, similarly, as what we've seen before and what you've done in Python in that show. Is that a signal for I want to read? Oh, okay. Uh, requires to deal with a single reference that stores how far we've come in the iteration of the list. Uh, we're going to use the unsaved version of the list, which uh, is none, get value, and get tail. But a visit method would be better, but I'm, we're trying to keep things simple to isolate them. This is the iterable, the iterable version of a list. Look, the iterable list implements iterator of t. Inside, it has a list of t, which we call list, which is the current element of the list being iterated that we're going through. And in get next, look, if the list is empty, or is none, <coughs> then empty would be better. <coughs> then we re return <coughs> none. Why do we return none here? Because the list is empty. So what for element could we return? Okay. None? <laughs> none. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, on line 10 and 11, the list is not empty. So we store in a temporary variable 
the current element of the list. We move forward to the next element of the list, but before, the, uh, before quitting, we return sum of value, which puts inside the sum container the current element of the list. And why is it sum and not none? Because we have a current element. And so we not only give the element, but by, by putting, look, here, this here tells us at least two things. By giving sum of temp.get value, what does it tell us? When we get a sum, what pieces of information do we have? Two of them. It's not none. It's not none, so we still have to iterate. And no, that, that's the fact. The fact that it's sum tells us it's not the end of the list. Yes. And inside here, we, here's the current element. Yes. Okay. We don't need a single piece of data structure. I have a question. So why did he have the judgment to do it in that order? Yes. <laughs> because life is. Constellated with the random choices sometimes. Now, actually, if it were up to me, I would have done this with a list, with a visit. So this would look like a return list dot. I'm not going to write it in Visual Studio, so don't worry. But this is what it. Hello. Oh, it's there. It's there, but it can't be shown. Yes. Okay. Would look something like this: return list dot visit. Then. In the first case, we would simply, uh, this is for the, the empty list, we would say uh, return uh, new none. And in the other case, we would have the current element and the tail, and we would say return new sum of x. Pretty but then again, slightly less visible. Yes? But otherwise, I mean, these two things. What you do when you're empty, and what you do when you're not empty, you don't really have an order, you know. No, no it was more factual. First, storing the, uh, the, the value of, of one uh, element of the collection. Oh, you're talking about that? Yeah. Oh, well, that's another question, and I like it. Uh, now, the problem is, so this here, list is equal to list.cat has to happen before return. Yeah, wow. Because otherwise, if we return, then, and this happens after the return, then it's not really going to happen, right? Because return jumps out of the procedure. So this has to happen before, but if do list is equal to list.get day, then we lose a reference to the current element, which we need inside here. Yeah. So we store a reference to the current element, we move to the next, and then we return it. There is no way to do that in any other order, those three lines of code. Yeah. Unless you do it with a visitor, then, then it changes slightly. Now, and please don't leave it there. Yeah. So, uh, in Java, this is. Now, there is a sub one subtle difference. Who's got a killer instinct to find it? <laughs> yes, thank you. The double <laughs> point becomes. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, in a similar way, uh, when dealing with an array, we would deal with the index of the array. So this looks exactly the same. So we build an iterable array which contains an array, an index that starts at minus one, so we stay always one step behind. One, one step behind. Uh, in get next, if the index plus one is greater or equal than array dot length, then what does this mean? Yeah, if they're still, then, then we're done. We've reached the end of the array. So what we return? None. We can't go to the next element. We, we could, do, could we do here array of index? If we did here on line 9 array of index, what would that result in? Index out of bounds exception. We would get an error because you can't, if you have an array of 10 elements, you can't access element, I don't know, 10 or 11 or 12. It just crashes because there is no element, uh, no element to access. Now, on the other hand, in this else, now we do have an index. So we do index is equal to index plus one, because we started from minus one, so we're always one step behind. 
we go to the next element and we return sum over the of index. And this sum over the of index tells us two things. And what are they? They were not done. And we have a value. What is the type of the value, by the way? T. So what's T going to become? Whatever you want. You have a, that's the point of T. This iterable will work to iterate a collection of cars, flowers, persons, integers, of iterables. Could we have a, a, an iterable of iterables, of ints? Of course, why not? So t might be whatever we want it to be, as long as it's a valid type. OK? Good. Now, so every container, iterable, we then store a reference to the collection, plus some way to know which is the current element and how to go to the next. And that's it. Now, for every container, the plumbing is trivial. I mean, I hope that you don't find it hard. In the sense that, I mean, you know what the iterable has to do. So if you know it, then just doing it for a concrete collection should not be hard. It's not like something that you, that you say, oh my god, what's the meaning of line 7? <coughs> Did I pick a reasonable line? No. What's the meaning of line 8? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of obvious. Check if you, you've got into the end of the array. And, and for every collection, depending on how the collection is implemented, you will have something similar. So the plumbing internally is kind of trivial per container, which is nice because it means that building the iterables is not hard. Using them is quite easy because you just simply go through the thing until you get to none, right? And that's it. So we've, we've turned something that could be a potentially <coughs> complex problem into two very stupid problems. Which is nice, just, just by put, you know, just by splitting it into two pieces, no, the two pieces are both easy. It's a turkey. It's a turkey theory. Eating the turkey. Yes. Now, did you forget about eating the turkey? No, no, it's very, very good. <laughs> what? Good. So, um, on the other hand, in the literature, or in typical library, So, in the literature, you will typically find another traditional implementation of iterables, of iterators. And this other implementation has three methods instead of just one. And these methods are move next, has next, and get current. Now, take a wild guess. What does move next do? Kinda? Yes, but the other direction. <laughs> so move next goes to the next element. What does get current? If it's not empty. Use the current element. And what does has next? Sorry. Checks if there is a next value. But, and here I see it, this implementation is less safe than the one we've just seen. Why? It's less safe. There are ways to make it break. Well, <coughs> it moves before it checks if there is even one element. It moves. I mean, there is no mechanism to prevent us from calling get current before having called has next. We could also call move next after has next has told us that is false. What does get current do if we are past the end? Now look at the signature. It has to return a T. Yeah. yeah. And what is it going to return? No. The first thing that says null, I'm going to I'm going to hit. If it's an int, can you return null for an int? Well, in Java it is an integer, so you could, which is a bit of a monstrosity because I mean it's an integer. So yeah. Anyway, but the point is, null may not make any sense. Null is dangerous. So could you return null? But how do you distinguish the fact that it's null because the collection was over rather than it was a proper null in the collection? Do you understand the difference? So you could have a collection where, I don't know, suppose a collection of, of persons, okay? And you have uh, Charlie, Bob, and Null. I mean, they, they, Null is a, is a person. It's non-person, but it's a person, okay? But 
after null, you have Alice. Okay? But you just told me, I'm not picking on you, don't worry. Yeah. But if, uh, if, because it is reasonable to say, okay, let, let's take the lazy shortcut and say, when a collection is done, if you call get current, you get null. And now it's very ambiguous because when you get null, you might be tempted to say, oh, the collection is done, it's over. But no, because after null, you have Alice. Then you have null because it's now done, because it's now over. Okay? So, no. Then what? It could be done, it's kind of ugh, ugly, it's unclear. Then you would have another alternative that if you call get current before, uh, after the collection is, is completely iterated, you could also get an exception, an error, something that says, boom, I can't do this. That's also a bit of a, of a sad solution. Hmm. But for, I think, mostly historical reasons, uh, and also because option is becoming a concept in modern standard libraries, kind of since quite recently, because in Java, uh, in the, it's only since the very last version of Java that we do have option in the standard library. It's like two years. So th there are, let's say, historical artifacts why, there is, why you will find this, which is a bit of an inferior solution, rather than the one we've just seen. The one we've just seen will, I expect, become predominant in the coming years, but not yet. So the thing is, okay, so if this is what we typically find, but the other one with option is what we would like to have because it's safe, it just cannot go wrong. Because it cannot go wrong, you can keep calling move next and you get none, and there is no reason to invent anything. None is a better alternative to just inventing a null out of thin air. So my question is, okay, but what if we typically get this and we would like to have the other, yes? If you would actually execute the code in wrong order, so get current before anything else? Yeah, depending on the implementation. Yeah, it depends. Depend. Exactly. You don't know from the interface. That's the problem. Uh, okay. That's what makes this unsafe. You have to go read the documentation. But it's not immediately obvious from the documentation. Whereas in the other hand, you have only one method that always succeeds. You see the difference. Here you have three, and you have to call them in a specific order. And there is nothing that forces you to call it in this order. So this is an interface that can be misused. And to be honest, actually, yeah, there, there are implementations where this uh, bool here is here. So uh, this looks like bool move next. So this is bool move next, and you don't have has next. And every single time, I do happen to wonder, do I have to call what is move next? Where does it start? Where does it go? It starts from before the first element, and uh, it's unpleasant. So, OK. But, is there, oh, Java, it's exactly the same. Now, is there a way to convert an instance of this into its safe alternative, into its safe counterpart? Sorry? I bet there is. You bet correctly. And I'm telling you what you're going to show us in the next slide. So, one thing that's very <laughs> entertaining to do and also quite powerful is that we can but we're going to see this in depth in the next lecture in the form of adapters we can adapt a traditional iterator into an iterator so we find a class make safe that implements iterator this is our iterator the one that returns option the pretty one and what we get in the constructor of make safe is a traditional iterator this one with the three unlimiteds and then we implement the iterator based on the three ugly methods. And look how we do it. We have get next, and what get next does is, first of all, it checks if iterator dot has next. And if you do have next, we move to the next one and we return new sum of iterator dot get current. Otherwise, we we'll return none. So this means that if you ever expect an iterator but have a traditional iterator, what will you do? Adapt. You build a make safe around the traditional iterator. Good. Oh, in Java, yes, uh, there is a subtle difference. Implements. Yes. In conclusion, iterating collections happens to be an activity which is time-consuming, 
because every time you actually have to type in the way to iterate, remember why car dot is empty, not, etc. It's error prone because every time you do it, did you ever forget the last line, the one that says car is equal to car dot tail? Never happened to anyone here. So to me, to me, it's actually happened, but to you, no? It has happened. Oh, very good programmer. Oh, oh, it has happened. So. Okay, uh, so it's error prone. And if you want to change the collection, well, that, then, then it's a bit of an issue because then you change the collection and that now the dot tail is empty, etc. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So, iterators are the mechanism that hides the complexity of a collection that provides a clean interaction surface to iterate all collections in the very same way. You want to change the collection? You want to iterate it? None of this poses any issue anymore because you only go through the shared interface. And this mechanism not only reduces the amount of code that you have to write, therefore achieving or approximating better the right principle, but it also reduces the amount of coupling because iterating a collection to, for example, print all its elements does not require any specific knowledge of, of the collection itself anymore. outside world, all your elements. Now to iterate, what you, what you would have to write, roughly, mind you, would be something, but it's exactly every single time the same. So you would say, uh, now, uh, you have iterator t, it is equal to, and then here you build your iterator, and then what you do is, uh, mm, wait a second, uh, oh. mm -hmm. now, Option of t car is equal to it dot get next y car dot is sum and here what you do is car is equal to it dot get next and here you can do whatever you want do whatever you want on Got it? So, and what is, okay, is this print? Is this something else? Yeah. You don't know, you don't care. Uh, so, the point is, iterating the collection is always exactly the same. Now, look, look, at the, look at the three points there. The iterator might come from an array, from a linked list, from whatever else, but the only thing that changes, if, if the collection changes, the only thing that would change would be here, the thing that stays in, in the three dots. Okay? Good. And this is a simple piece of code that you, yeah, that never changes. And actually, most languages have some uh, specific syntax that, for example, in C sharp it's for each bar, current is equal to, etc. Have you, have you seen for each somewhere? Which ex assumes that the thing is an iterator. And I trace the iterator, or in Java, I think it's uh, auto car double point and here be terrible. And this assumes it's an iterable and goes through it. And the point is the reason why it can work for all these constructs is always that all these collections implement iterable. Uh, yes? Anything else? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
when you what were you expecting? This is your terrible. Oh. <laughs> yes? One of these days I will actually kill you. <laughs> Next to me, do we have to why you shouldn't be? Uh, you do have five lectures. Uh, I think you can stop the camera now. Okay. Uh, you have